everyone, and welcome to the EdTech Podcast, the show about new ideas in education, teaching, and learning. I'm Sophie Bailey. This week, we've got an awesome takeover episode on dyslexia and technology, featuring Dr. Kate Saunders from the British Dyslexia Association and Mike Tolfson from Microsoft Education. 10% of the population are estimated to be dyslexic. That means for every 10 of your colleagues or 10 of your students or 10 of your relatives or friends, on average, one has dyslexia. In the workplace, the law stipulates that you must make reasonable adjustments to accommodate the needs of dyslexics. That might mean managing overloading environments such as open plan offices, adjusting intranets or screens so that they are less stimulating, allowing for longer time periods for organisation or kicking off a dyslexia mentoring scheme within your place of work. But what is being done before work in schools, colleges and universities to move the national dialogue to one which celebrates neurodiversity at the earliest moment? And how can technology assist dyslexic learners? In this episode, we look at tech tools and coping strategies for dyslexic learners, what resources, training and funding is available for teachers working with dyslexic learners, Microsoft's learning tools, OneNote and Classroom Note features for dyslexic learners, the story behind how this came to fruition and an efficacy pilot study between the BDA, Microsoft and Norhill School in the UK on how such tools are improving outcomes. We also talk a bit about playing the banjo, people who have inspired Kate and Mike, the Seattle music scene and celebrating difference. Dr Saunders also puts an important call out to the wider edtech community to assist on ideas for how to connect with young people through technology to continue to innovate BDA services. If you want to help on that, you can email helpline at bdadyslexia.org.uk and they will be very excited to hear from you. If you want to listen in to the full solo edits of each interview, you'll also find these and all reference links on the EdTech podcast feed. And you can find out more at bdadyslexia.org.uk and www.onenote.com forward slash learning tools. Finally, if you're listening to this in time and attending BET this year in London, you can also meet Dr. Kate Saunders and Mike Tolfson in person at the Microsoft Village stand to discuss in more detail. Have a great week, everyone, and do send your feedback on email, Twitter, Anchor, or the Facebook page. It would be great to hear from you all. It's nine minutes past eight, and um, I'm delighted to be speaking today with Dr. Kate Saunders, who's the CEO of the British Dyslexia Association. So good morning, Kate. Morning, Sophie. And thank you for joining us. So what what I wanted to kick off with today was just to find a little bit more about you, particular background, a little bit about the particular learner needs of people with dyslexia and a bit about how technology might help and partnerships that you have going at the moment. So just to start, could you tell us a little bit about your particular background and how long you've been in this field as well? Okay, so um, my background is as a dyslexic who was diagnosed when they were at uh, first year at university, um, having struggled to retake A-levels. And then I, I did a psychology degree. I became a dyslexia specialist teacher, special needs teacher. And then I worked for some years in special educational needs um, as a, a special educational need coordinator and then an advisory teacher for a local authority um, before um, joining the uh, British Dyslexia Association initially as their head of education and then CEO. Um, I also worked for many years as a psychologist doing diagnostic assessments for dyslexia. And as I understand it, the British Dyslexia Association has now been going for 40 years. That's right, yes. Um, And it was started by um, a group of of parents who were um, just trying to find out about why it was that their children were having um, unexplained difficulties with learning, reading, writing, spelling. Um, In the days when there wasn't really very much knowledge about it within the academic field, um, And they went over to America initially to find out uh, this emerging field over there, brought the information back here, started training teachers. And the British Dyslexia Association still is the accredited body for dyslexia specialist teachers in the UK. That's uh, very interesting. So I saw on your website this morning, I've been having a it's my, my six o'clock in the morning reading, was well getting done. to know the British Dyslexia Association website. And um, so I saw you have quite a, a substantial part of the website there dedicated to education and resources for teachers and 
looking at uh, what the training might be. And I just wondered, actually, I mean, how do you feel that the knowledge or the resources for teachers and also the government focus in this area has changed, say, over the last 10 years? I mean, I think it, it, it has got better in that I think there's much better awareness in general throughout society about dyslexia. Most people now in the UK, I think, have heard of the word and they generally know that it is um, linked to people who have difficulty learning reading and spelling. That's that's the, the sort of general perception. Mm-hmm. And the education system is more aware, but it's not consistent. Um, so we still don't have a mandatory content for initial teacher training about dyslexia. Each training provider decides whether or not they put in content on dyslexia and this is one of our major campaign areas and we have been pushing hard with the government for those 40 years um, and I would say in particular over the last six years or so um, to say look this really isn't good enough you know 10% of the of the population has some degree of dyslexia so in a class of 30 at least three children on average will have a dyslexic difficulty. Mm. So everybody who teaches in the education system teaches dyslexic pupils. Therefore, everybody who is a teacher needs to be trained to understand how to spot the signs of dyslexia, how to teach in a dyslexia-friendly way in the classroom, and when to signpost on for further intervention and assessment if if appropriate. And those are the three key things that we want to see all teachers have in their intra teacher training. Um, The government has funded us and some colleagues within the field to produce teacher training materials. So those exist. Mm -hmm. um, And we are currently doing some rollout for primary schools, secondary schools and further education colleges. And the materials will be freely available on the BDO website from January. Um, so that anybody can download them and use them. In the meantime, anybody who's interested in attending for free a day's training, um, if they look on our website, it's bdadyslexia.org.uk, for where the events are um, around the country. Um, How does the funding, if a child does have dyslexia, is identified as doing so? uh, Is it similar in some of the other um, SEND areas? Is the funding sort of with the parent in terms of how they feel it should be spent or is it with the school or it, it's um, um it, it's it's not very easy to access mm. essentially um the the legislation is really clear that the school has a duty to identify a child's special educational needs the parent has a right to um request that the school um, investigates if they feel that their child has special educational needs. Um, the school has a duty to have regular conversations with the parent about those needs. Um, but the legislation says that the school has a duty to identify, but in actual fact, um, the only way to tell whether a child definitely has to set a deficit difficulty is to do a full diagnostic assessment. And that has to be carried out by either a dyslexia specialist trained teacher or uh, usually a a chartered educational psychologist Um, and the local authorities simply do not have enough of those and they do not have enough funds Mm. to pay for enough assessments to meet the needs. And and in terms of the particular learner needs of someone with dyslexia what do you see as the particular needs that they have? Okay so dyslexics essentially have difficulty with symbols, strings of symbols. So they can have difficulty hearing the difference between symbols. So some dyslexic children can't hear the difference between certain letters and sounds, let's say. If they can't hear the difference, it's difficult for them to choose the right letter. Um, But they can also have difficulty remembering a string of symbols, either that they've heard or that they've seen. So if you imagine the child then is not building up a really clear memory of what a word looks like written down. Yeah. So next time they come to see that word, they can't check it against their memory. So very often with dyslexia, you will see this characteristic type of spelling where they, they tend to spell things the way they sound. 
because they can't look on their kind of visual blueprint for how it should look. So the only recourse they have is to try to spell it the way that it, that it sounds. Um, so the difficulty, of course, with English is it's not phonetically regular. We have all sorts of very strange things that letters do within words. And and so this is, is a, a great complexity for, for dyslexics as learners. Um, the, the emphasis currently in the English system on phonics training is good for dyslexic pupils because they need very explicit training of phonological skills. In other words, linking the sound to the letter and being able to work with sounds within words. So being able to take a word and break it down into sounds. Dyslexics have difficulty with working memory, which means that if you if you imagine a dyslexic individual trying to work with a string of letters, it may be for a severe dyslexic that their memory starts to break down after just two letters in a row. And as you, you can um, appreciate, most words have more than two letters in them. So in working with dyslexics, we tend to break words down into chunks. We tend to break them into syllables and then sometimes chunks within syllables because that makes it more accessible for them within working memory. But dyslexics also have huge learning strengths very often. So they find it difficult to remember and work with strings of symbols just by hearing or just by seeing them. But if you build in strengths like making sense of things. So if you give them rules and patterns that make sense to them that they can apply, if you use pictures, if you use stories, if you use logic, if you use movement, if you use touch and what we call multi-sensory learning, which is where you have the sound, the, um, the auditory input and also the touch input at the same time, then you're giving that dyslexic person's brain a much better chance to learn. So really, the way I see it is that that actually dyslexics are really good learners. Yeah. But what you have within the education system is a mismatch between the way they learn and the way they're taught. So what we say to teachers is the challenge for you is if they cannot learn the way you teach, can you teach the way they learn? <laughs> And this is where we get really excited about technology. And, and, and just thinking about the next part of that and um, going into the workplace. Yes. Do, do you feel that the workplace is more ready for dyslexics as well and supportive of, of, of people with a particular style of learning? I mean, again, it's quite patchy. Um, there is a need for, for much more awareness training. And um, we do a lot of awareness training now with employers. Um so this is something that, that has evolved really over the last 40 years. I would say for the last 15 years in particular, there's been much more emphasis on employers as well as, as education. Um, within the workplace, the type of difficulties dyslexics have can be to do with reading, writing, spelling, but also um, are more predominantly in adults to do with organisational skills, time management, prioritising and also ways of working. So dyslexics can very often be really good at problem solving, at thinking outside the box, coming up with solutions other people wouldn't think of. Um, the way I think about it is that the dyslexic brain makes connections that other brains can't make. That's my personal way of, of, of looking at it. Um, but also dyslexic people who have succeeded enough to be in employment and, and you know there is um, a whole raft of those who who don't sadly make it, um, and we can talk about those more. I mean, there are higher numbers of dyslexics, for example, in the, the prison system than there should be. Well, that on your campaign area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we we've also worked extensively with youth offending teams, for example, to try and help to turn around that pattern. But for those who who have succeeded enough to be able to get into employment, um, they have also built up some very useful strategies along the way. Um, not least of all, resilience and a kind of ability to be able to stick at it when other people would give up. So they will be the ones who in the team will be coming up with bright ideas, who will be uh, thinking of, of innovative ways to link things together, but who also will be determined to stick at it when the rest of, of the team might say, well, actually, you know, uh, we've, we've you know, thought of a few things, we'll give up now, or we tried this and we'll give up. Um, and the dyslexic who has really good resilience 
is like to say, well, no, I think there's something here. I'm going to keep going because I really think, you know, I, I can see the possibility in this. And what does happen with dyslexics in employment is that they tend to put in many more hours than their peers. Often they will do this in a hidden sort of way because they perhaps not feeling comfortable about declaring their dyslexic in the workplace. They're not sure whether they will meet stigma um, and prejudice. They're not sure if it will go against them. Um, and this, again, is where um, uh, we work with employers for them to understand that they have responsibilities under the Equalities Act, that they do have a duty to um, make reasonable adjustments for the dyslexic people in employment. So it's funny what you uh, described about the visual learning or the different ways of making sense of patterns, because um, I, I'm sure this has come across your radar, but, but the AA girl, the uh, writer, yes. and uh, you know his recent passing away, but I was reading about how you know he would essentially, he wouldn't write down when he went to do a review. He would... Uh, do some sketches of the people um, that were around him and what he wanted to record about and he would sort of take that to one of the sub team I think and then they would you know help him piece together okay that was this person this was this person and as a result you know he'd write this award-winning prose around it and, and journalistic writing and it's just you know I think for for lots of people that's like a completely different way of going about things but um you know, absolutely amazing writing. Absolutely extraordinary writing. I did have the pleasure of meeting him once yeah, really. he came to one of our um, local dyslexia association meetings um, and subsequently wrote a wonderful double page article about his own dyslexia, mm. um, which I was really pleased about because I think it really does put across that being dyslexic is not about not being able to produce really clear and pithy and sharp um, written text. It is about the fact that you might just do that in a different way. So um, he dictated um, all of his writing. Um, so he was he was the writer who didn't write. Yeah. Um, but, you know, fantastic the way that he was able to hone in on the use of language to put across things in a in a very sharp but also humorous way. And actually, there are many famous dyslexic writers so uh we have hans christian anson for example really? who um uh, wrote the ugly duckling story which i don't think is a coincidence because after all it's about somebody who has difficulty in their early years and then subsequently mm-hmm. is able to show themselves for who they really are you know which is what we're about really is about people being able to be recognized for their individuality for their neurodiversity for what they bring to society um and and you know what we hope for is a is a society that will celebrate that and enable that, um, and I think this the, the, these visual abilities that dyslexics can have. I mean, it's quite quite interesting because um, A. A. Gill actually was was somebody who would argue whether or not dyslexics had. Um, particular strong visual strengths and yet clearly he was using them because that was his natural way of processing in the way that he was doing things and and I think what we can say is that you know not all dyslexics are geniuses in one particular area I mean he was obviously um, I think I think we can say he was a genius in the way that he was writing Um, but he didn't consider himself to be an artistic genius for example Um, and yet he did, as I understand it, um, go to art college. Um, he felt, I think, that that he was sort of directed in that direction because because he had difficulty with the literacy side. Yeah. And of course, that's that's a danger as well. You know, we want people to be able to go into the fields that that actually do match what they want to do with their lives. You know. Um, and the reasonable adjustment thing is about enabling that. So nowadays, when we talk about reasonable adjustments, we're talking about use of technology. So, you know, it could be um, dictation software. It could be readback software. It could be using uh, recording materials for meetings, for example. Um, it could be using materials where you can dictate into something that makes, uh, let's say, a mind map on the screen, and then you can turn it into a nice, neat list, which is more likely to be more difficult for most dyslexics, and into a project plan, for example. Yes. 
And and there are so many ways now that, that are really useful for dyslexics. We have now, you know, the stylus pens where you can write and, and it can interpret what you've put and either keep it as a picture, you could do a sketch, you could keep it as a picture, or it can interpret handwriting if it's close enough. And this is, of course, one of the challenges for dyslexic handwriting um, and put it into type text. So there are so many different things now um, um, that could be useful in the technology for dyslexics. And, and as a dyslexic yourself, are there any particular technological tools or applications that you particularly like or find useful in your own life? I photograph a lot. Oh, really? So um, I will take if if I, I I'm not very comfortable visually working from a screen. Yeah. Um, and some dyslexics also have a visual stress effect where the glare from a white page or from the screen can be quite sharp. So even though there are things that you can do to kind of calm that down, personally, and not all dyslexics are the same. Personally, I prefer working from paper that has got a kind of cream colored background to cut down the glare. So I will print things off and then I will, what I call jimmy them. In other words, I will um, mark them by hand and then I will photograph them. Interesting. So even if I'm on a train, I photograph it and I send it back to the office and then they can um, work from what I've, I, what I've jimmied and they will type it up for me. So um, yeah, I do a lot of photographing, even things like, you know, if, if you're out and about and there are uh, train timetables up and you just photograph them, use of apps yeah. for travel, all of those sorts of things. The main thing for me that's really useful about technology is the organisational skills, benefits. So, the you know, um, calendars, reminders, uh, journey maps, sat navs. So I have all of those things. And, and also there is the kind of... Um, Use which I'm sure will come more and more with the the, the type of what I call a kind of personal assistant speaking back to you on, on yep. technology. So um, although I have um, my information that I carry around with me, which will tell me you know where I'm going for a particular meeting, what time I've got to be there, um, it'll have a map. Um, that I could access so that I can you know follow the directions as I'm walking along the street and all of those sorts of things but still there are times when I will need somebody who I can say um what time is my meeting or it, something like that because some part of that um organizational skills process will have gone wrong for me yeah so and and I think that's that's the thing that people don't realize about adult dyslexia in the workplace is just how challenging the organisational stuff is. And the other thing that's dis challenging for, for dyslexics, um, time management, prioritising. So I've had a lot of, of coaching around those things. Um, and there is a very good um, government-funded uh, scheme in England um, at the moment um, called Access to Work. Okay. So... Um, what this is, is that, that the adult dyslexic can have an access to work assessment um, whereby they are essentially have an interview with somebody uh, from access to work um, who does a workplace assessment. And basically, this is a conversation about that person's needs within the workplace. So it is what their equipment needs are, but also what their coaching needs are, what their support needs are. So very severe dyslexic, for example, um, might need to have support work, a support worker um, to help them. Yeah. Um, they might need coaching for a certain period of time around strategies because the reasonable adjustments are not just for the employer to make, they're also for the employee to make. You know, they have a responsibility to make reasonable adjustments as well. Um, but it may be that the access to work assessment recommends also training for colleagues, including managers, for example. Um, so that might involve a day's awareness training for all of the staff. And it might help them to understand why that person, for example, is having these really genuine difficulties. Um, 
and and there can be things still around working memory, such as as taking messages on a phone accurately without a, a, a further recording mechanism for that. Um, it might be around um, needing recording mechanisms for within meetings. So, for example, if it says it can can have a technological way for recording what's happening in a meeting, it frees them up to not have to concentrate on making notes at the same time as they're listening to what's happening. So, and these things are, are, can be quite crucial around not overloading the working memory. And you've got a lot of uh, text-to-speech facilities on your website, and I'm guessing that's quite a useful mechanism. Yes, and we do feel it's important that organisations in general make their information um, on their websites and their written information available in accessible formats. This might be that they simply have, you know, um, text-to-speech facilities, um, but it might also be that if they have, you know, printed material, that they make that available possibly on um, uh, a CD-ROM or some other downloadable accessible PDF, for example, that can be used with text text um, readback software. And there are guidelines for dyslexia-friendly web material and dyslexia-friendly printed material. So we have a thing called the Dyslexia Style Guide, which is free to download from our website, which has guidance about those things. So we, we, we advise the use of a, a clear font, for example. So it's a clear a clear font is basically one without lots of twiddly bits. Mm. And at least um, a size 12 font, we prefer a slightly buff background rather than a sort of vivid white background for this visual glare um, effect um, and non-dyslexics are going to suffer visual stress as well as, as dyslexics and there are, are some adjustments around workplace for example working environment so in addition in, in addition to the technology that a, a dyslexic person might require um, dyslexic people might for example not be best suited necessarily to an open plan situation Mm-hmm. And this is partly because of the distractions going on around them that might increase the overload effect. But also, um, dyslexics, because they tend to learn well by touch, they often remember where things are in a physical way. So in, in the office of a dyslexic, if you say, um, have you got such and such, they can usually reach out and touch where they've put whatever it is. Now, in technological terms, they might visualise that and have their folders in different places. But the way that they organise their folders might have a, a greater visual component for them to be able to find it almost as if they were reaching out and touching it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. So these are subtleties, but they're really important because for a dyslexic individual, it can be highly stressful if they can't find things because they're already under quite a lot of stress in the workplace, trying to do things the same way that everybody else does them. Um, that that whole thing about being able to access things and find them quickly is, is a really, really key part of their, their whole organisational skills uh, strategy. So perhaps hot desking, not the, not the best. Not the best. I mean, um, dyslexics are individuals as well, you know, and some dyslexics may be so good with their technology that actually, you know, they've got it so well pegged that actually as long as they've got their machine with them, it, they're fine, you know. Um, so it varies. Um, what's really useful, actually, is where those who have done that um, pass on how they did that to the rest of us because some of us are not at that stage, so there's a really useful thing in that, you know, we have we have really successful dyslexics in, in all work, walks of life who have found strategies and the sharing of that can be a really useful thing. Um, so we have a, at the BDA a, a new technologies committee and they are a group of volunteers and they um, assist us through our website. They have certain pages on our website where they will have information about the various different types of supportive and accessible technology that are useful for dyslexics across the age ranges. And they will also very kindly, as volunteers, answer individual emails. So the general public, we have 20,000 odd inquiries a year from the wow. general public. Um, about half of those are about children, about half of them are adults. And they will answer individual email inquiries if somebody has a particular 
a need. Um, and what we do is we give a range of, of what's available. So it's um, really around the sort of the generalities of of what would be useful for for somebody looking for a particular type of, of solution. So it's a kind of review or peer review support system for, for how technology may be relevant, what's out there. Yes, essentially amongst the volunteers that we have around the table are, are um, and on this group, are a number of, of people who are variously sort of interested in technology. And so, for example, we have a, a wonderful lady called E.A. Draffen, who's a, um, a lecturer at Southampton University, who in, on her own sort of personal um, uh, website, for fun, has done a sort of quick review of 2,000 pieces of technology, assistive technology. So that will give you an idea of the kind of yeah. scope and knowledge base of, of, of these what individuals. What people do for fun. Exactly, exactly. Um, of course, we're hugely grateful because they give immense you know, amounts of time for free as volunteers to us as a charity. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, this is the privilege of working within a charity is that you come across these extraordinary individuals who are, who are are happy to help people just to help you know and so for those listening the british dyslexia association technology committee website can be found at bdatech.org i wanted to ask a little bit about your collaboration with microsoft and what that's all about and how you've been working together Okay, so so I'm I'm really excited about this project. So so what we have is a, a project currently with Microsoft, which involves using OneNote uh, tool um, on Surface devices with some dyslexic children in a dyslexia specialist school. And what we wanted to do was some pre and post testing. There's, there's a 10 week intervention where the children are trying the use of this these devices. Um, and the OneNote tool in class as part of what they're doing with the general classroom curriculum. And so it's a a 10 week span for them to use this. And at the start, we did some testing. So we tested the children's reading, spelling, phonological skills and a measure of of kind of of self-esteem. And at the end of the 10 year um period we will retest and see if there's a significant significant difference in in their schools versus the kind of progress that you would normally have expected so so that's the basic structure and and when did that start um so it started at the start of the autumn term and they are most of the way through but not all of the way through their 10 week period currently we do the retesting in early January and we will have uh, results at BET. Um, and the thing for me around, in general, the use of, of devices and, and tools like this, as a, as a dyslexia specialist teacher, i give you an example. We're talking about multi-sensory learning being um, a, a really effective way of dyslexic learning. So what you have here is is the opportunity for individuals to use a stylus pen so to to do copying over with a stylus pen for the stylus pen to record their writing for the information that that they're looking at to have not only the the text read back and and um, uh, those facilities but also photographing facilities so that they can photograph text, it can then be uh, transferred into something that can use the, the text readback, etc. Um, but also at, for, at the teaching level, that you can take have words broken down into syllables. Yes. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's this chunking to manageable parts is a really useful thing for dyslexic learners. Um, the other thing is about building independence for these learners. So you can imagine for a dyslexic in the classroom, they very often, because of the memory difficulties, need to go back to the teacher and ask, am I doing this right? Is this OK? You know, um, can you just remind me of uh, the series of instructions you just gave me because they can't remember a series of instructions? Um and, and we need those to be broken down as well. Can you just remind me of this spelling, for example? 
But what you have when you have the use of devices is that you have things recorded on them, which means that they don't have to keep going back to the teacher. And so what you're doing is you're building independence. You're, you're enabling them to cut down those things which undermine their self-esteem and build yeah. up their confidence. So in general terms, I think, you know, there is so much that technology can do. Um, and one of the, the major things that we're trying to do with this project is to feed back to Microsoft things that they could build into the development of materials that would make them more dyslexia friendly. So let me give you an example of one of the things that we... In fact, I spoke to Mike Tolson at Microsoft and that's one of the questions I asked him was, uh, what's the shopping list people always give you? I mean, there there are a number of things that the teachers have have mentioned. For example, um, the way that uh, in different dyslexia specialist teaching programmes, they use slightly different, the different programs that exist already, by which I mean the teaching programs, use different syllable segmentation rules, okay, just to confuse things further. Um, so as a teacher, you're going to want to be able to adjust the way the words are broken into syllables to match the way you're teaching, All right? So having the ability to be able to change the way that the rules that are behind the syllable segmentation yep. could be a useful teaching thing. Um, another thing that's really helpful for dyslexics um, who have visual perceptual difficulties um, is around the teaching of handwriting. And this is, we, the dyslexics tend to have, um, not all dyslexics, but, but many dyslexics tend to have a characteristic uneven handwriting. So they have handwriting that doesn't sit on the line. It tends to go up above the line. The letters are different sizes. It has a general untidy appearance. It slopes this way and that way. Um, And this is in spite of what we would call ordinary handwriting, teaching and practice, okay? So we do advise that dyslexics learn touch typing, that they, they have access to that as, a, as an additional tool. But we'd also like them to have the option of, you know, being able to write fluently if, if you know, if they need to. Um, I mean, freedom is a wonderful thing, but you can only exert it if actually you have the ability to do those things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so with the handwriting, with the younger children, for example, one of the reasons why dyslexics don't, that have visual perceptual problems can't get their handwriting to sit on the line is because they sometimes have a visual perceptual difficulty. And this means that the brain literally isn't telling them where the line is. So you can give a dyslexic with a visual perceptual problem two shapes to copy. And on what you show them, supposing it's it looks like a kind of a box in a circle. And on what you show them, the two things touch in a corner And it's in front of them and you ask them to copy it. But what they give you, they will draw a box and they'll draw a circle, but they won't draw them touching. Okay. And that's even though it's in front of them. So this now is not memory. This is visual perception. The message the brain is giving them about where those lines meet is not reliable. And similarly, with the children with the handwriting, the message that the brain is giving them about where whether their writing is on the line is not reliable. So they can't put it on the line. But there's a really easy teaching technique, which is that you get a ruler and a highlighter pen, say a yellow highlighter pen. You put the ruler on the line and you draw a thick line, highlighter line, just with a flat edge of the highlighter line along the top of the ruler. So in other words, now you've got a thick yellow line, which is sitting effectively on top of the the line on the page. And then you say to the child, Keep your handwriting, keep the small letters inside the yellow. You get them to trace over yours initially, and then you do another line underneath, and you get them to copy independently underneath. And you see the handwriting just straighten out, just straightens out. And what it is is that the brain can see where the yellow is much more clearly than it can see where the line is. Well, And now this is 10 minutes of teaching, Okay, it's a really simple technique. And I got really excited about the, the, the use of technology around this because I can see that if the device, for example, 
had the capacity to have a yellow line in the middle and you can, you know, it's useful to have the capacity to change the colour of the line because different dyslexics and different different people with different visual stress can prefer different colours. But you start with yellow as a default um, and then you get the child to practice writing over an example of good handwriting and keeping their, the small letters inside the yellow. And then you are really winning in terms of multi-sensory reinforcement of that teaching and the use of color and pictures and stories and video material are really really useful for dyslexics and being able to for example video your teacher acting out a particular spelling rule um, and to, to be able to keep a little video of that that has a kind of an icon at the front you make up a, a, a video library of your spelling rules with a picture at the front which really clearly shows you what it is you know maybe it's um uh maybe the monomic is uh big elephants can't always use small exits um for because okay um and so your teacher has acted out a, a big elephant not being able to get through a small exit and which is the sort of thing that a dyslexia friendly teaching teacher might be doing because it puts it into video and pictures and and then you've got humor and you've got a story and you've got a monomic you've got all of those things together in the learning point you video that and then put it with a little icon which has got an elephant on okay because you know that your elephant word is your because word and then all you have to do is click on your elephant and it gives you the monomic for that word and that helps you with the spelling of the word and so if people want to find out about the pilot and how that ran and what's next, whereabouts are you speaking at BET? Um, so we're in, in the um, uh, Microsoft, I think they call it a learning. Um, Village. That's the one. Okay. Um, name finding is difficult for dyslexics as well. So um, actually, that's that's an interesting point, the name finding, because names are kind of uh, symbolic material and, which don't have meaning by themselves. So dyslexics have difficulty remembering things like history learning, names, places, um, yeah. dates, that kind of stuff. So also for adults and um, anniversaries, dare I say, um, which, again, is where technology and reminders that, that pop up a week earlier are very useful. And um, many a dyslexic adult has been berated by a partner for forgetting things, which maybe a few reasonable adjustments could be made. But there we are. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating area. There are so many aspects to the dyslexic difficulties. And I think this is one of the things that um, is not widely enough understood um, in the population as a whole, I think there is a basic understanding that it's to do with reading and spelling, but I don't. But I think there's, there's a much, a much deeper understanding actually about the way the dyslexic brain works, and about the the positives that those can bring for for society and for employers, as well as wider understanding of reasonable adjustments for things like organisational skills, time management, um, name finding, that you know all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I can see the similarities to some of the personality training you might do in work where you do adjust the different personality types and their needs and particular styles of uh, working. And actually knowing this now, what you've just described, uh, I have a few people in mind where I think actually, you know, you could give them a bit more remit or, you know, accommodate uh, that, that particular need. Yes. And I think, you know, and they're, they're, that's a win-win situation because what you have then is, a, is, is somebody who is less stressed, who, who performs better because they're less stressed. Um, and, and, you know, you as a team then are getting the benefits of, of their, you know, the, the abilities and, and the strengths that they do have. And I think where it works really well, you know, where, where organisations do make accommodations, reasonable accommodations for dyslexic individuals, um, they do see the benefits. And, um, and we are encouraging organisations now to have internal mentoring schemes, for example, for dyslexic. So there are a number of, of large organisations, um, Ernst & Young, for example, Shell, um, where dyslexic individuals within those organisations have started mentoring schemes, um, and we have a kind of um, you know we have guidance that we can we can give to to get things off the ground, um, and we're happy to go in and do a kind of you know um, 
uh, initial talk or training and um, to, to assist with that process. But essentially, it is the organisations themselves. And, and you know, what, what I say is that dyslexics, 10% of the population has some degree of dyslexic difficulty, and they are in every workplace. OK, so they are what I call our Trojan horse for awareness raising. Mm-hmm. And what we need to do is inspire them to have the confidence, particularly those who are, let's say, quite high up in an organisation where they, they don't feel so um, challenged. They're not so worried about about stigma going against them and those sorts of things. And, you know, these are real fears for people. Um, but they perhaps have the confidence to, to say, well, I am dyslexic. And and I am willing to uh, start a, a mentoring scheme within this organisation. And that might might take the form of, for example, a blog. It might be a forum. It might involve them organising speakers to come in. We have Dyslexia Awareness Week, um, first week in October each year. And sometimes they will organise for for in, you know inspirational people to come in and do talks. Talks about strategies, sharing of strategies. Do you also go into to do those workshops yes we do we do do um, a lot of training within schools so we will do um in set training we're also doing currently some videos with some department for education funding um of good dyslexia specialist teaching so um for example there's a video of that handwriting technique for example which we've recently done and those will be on the website from well we hope by the end of january and they will be free for anybody to access um so Uh, We have quite a lot of information that schools can download from the website. Um, For example, in Dyslexia Awareness Week, we always put up um, PowerPoints that they can use in assemblies. We also have dyslexia friendly criteria. So, again, free to download from the website. There are um, dyslexia friendly, the dyslexia friendly award is something for a whole organisation that's that's adopted dyslexia-friendly methods throughout. So we have those criteria for schools, colleges, universities, but also for organisations. So a company can apply to be dyslexia-friendly. And what happens is that they basically um, register to do the scheme. They do a self-audit against the, the criteria and then they usually take about 18 months to put in place the, the bits that they, they're not doing yet or the bits that they feel they need to do more consistently. Um, and that might involve, for example, having a whole a whole day's training for all of their staff. Um, and then when they feel that they have been able to evidence all of that, they are now meeting all of the criteria, the BDA will, will go and do um, a verification um, and we sample across the criteria. And if they are, are found to be meeting them, then they get the Dyslexia Friendly Award. And that then is a it, uh, it's a certificate. It's something they can put on their head of paper, etc. Um, and it lasts for three years and then they're re-verified because you know, people people move on and, and things can change. But the, the, the really good thing about the Dyslexia Friendly Scheme is it is the whole organisation. So in a, in a workplace, for example, it's about it's about the the reasonable adjustments being so built into what the um, organization does that that you actually don't have to think about them you know just to go back quickly the the school that you mentioned that was doing the pilot scheme with microsoft which school was that oh see now you're doing that that name thing with me oh i'm sorry yeah yeah i'm I'm, I'm not making me Adjustment. The school that we're doing this project with Microsoft is Knoll Hill School, mm-hmm. which is in Purbright in Surrey. So we're very grateful to them, obviously, for taking part um, and to the parents who've um, kindly agreed for us to you know, work with their children. And, and that model of that school and others like it. So when they're a dyslexic uh, sort of specialism school, does that mean that um, all of the children there have dyslexia or that they just are more set up to specifically help people with dyslexia so there are a a number of schools where their main purpose Mm. is to work with dyslexic children um nearly all of those are currently privately run schools in england there's one which is a, a state school um 
And this is, is one of the difficulties we have is that, unfortunately, within the state sector, within the, the mainstream um, sector, there are some schools that have units, dyslexia units, but there, there are not very many dyslexia specialist schools. Yeah. Um, and with the best will in the world, um, you, we can minimise the effects of dyslexia with early identification, mm. with good dyslexia-friendly work in the classroom, with good dyslexia-friendly teaching. Um, but there are some children for whom the, the the degree of and the severity of their dyslexia is such that they are best in a, a dyslexia specialist provision. What this gives them essentially is a much smaller class size use usually so in dyslexia special school you might have a class size of eight ten children versus 30 odd yeah. you also have um every teacher there with a real understanding of, of a dyslexia friendly work in the classroom so all of the work is presented in a dyslexia friendly way um and a, a real understanding of the learning mechanisms that work best for dyslexics in addition to that they very often get um, a targeted one-to-one. -one. Um, so, um, and they might work with a team of specialists. So um, dyslexia can come by itself. You know, you can have somebody who is, who is just dyslexic, but quite often you have some co-occurring difficulties, particularly with those who require specialist provision. So it may be that they have, for example, co-occurring attention deficit or dyspraxia, or um, um, sometimes a, a specific language impairment. So for that particular child, you may have a team around the child. Um, you might have a speech and language therapist who's involved. You might have a, an occupational therapist who's involved on doing motor patterning, for example. Um, so it's a, a, a very focused approach. My approach as a SENCO to all children with needs was essentially whatever the child needs, the child gets. And that was my kind of rule in my Senko department. Um, but, you know, the reality of it is, is that you know, most Senkos would love to be able to apply that rule, but they simply do not have the resources. And, and it does very often come down to financial resources um, to be able to do that. And, and this is where I think um, it can be very frustrating because they are dedicated professionals trying to work to help these children um, with their high, hands tied behind their backs. You know, if you, you know that the child needs a certain amount of help, but you simply cannot get it to them. Um, and we have seen in recent years, the um, specialist provision at local authority level has been decimated really mm -hmm. in, in recent years. So we used to have really good teams of dyslexia specialist teachers and educational psychologists working to support these children um, as a local authority group and they would go out then to the schools within that local authority but in many local authorities they have been all but disbanded and it's left increasingly for the schools to buy in uh, specialist provision as and when they need it and again what we have then is a difficulty with um, consistency and also, yeah. also with accountability you, see, you hear the same thing across training for if procurements happen for ed tech generally and now it's just left to the school and if the school you know if that's not a priority of theirs then it sort of just gets left and any benefits are diminished as well so I, I have I have you know in, in a sort of typical dyslexic way I, I think to myself okay well so what what are the what other things that we can do to help with this I think volunteers are a really important resource so mm. uh, you know employers out there that are willing to second anybody to go and do support work then please 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 do because that, that's a really useful resource and how can people get in contact with you if they're listening and they think actually yeah that's something I want to help with. Probably best thing, contact our helpline, if I give you that. So um, email is helpline at vdadyslexia.org.uk okay. okay. and they will send you to the right department. Um, and, yeah, we'd be very, very happy to hear from people who are willing to volunteer. Um, 
and also through our local um, dyslexia associations. So our local dyslexia associations are listed on our website. So if you have a look, and if there is one of those that's, that's close to you, if you contact them and say, you know, how can I help, they would be really, really pleased to hear from you. Um, the other thing that we need help with, and, and you know, in this technological field might be particularly relevant, is we need help as charities you know, we need help to understand how we can make best use of technology. So one of the challenges for us is how to engage with young people. The traditional kind of um, local dyslexia association model is volunteers who go to, let's say, monthly meetings. They have a committee. They organise speakers. They they link with schools and local authority. They they often run local helplines. They do this entirely voluntarily. Um, and some of some of these people have been doing this for us for more than 20 years. You no know, extraordinary the amount of time they give. Um, but what I hear from 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 them is that they find that it's really difficult for them to engage young people in that process because young people don't do things necessarily in that way. Yeah. If young people want to know information, they go on on Google. You know, they find it out through technology. And how then do we do we link up? those two things how do we get them engaged in this process which is about bringing them in as volunteers it's really interesting because on the episode this week we had a about chatbots and those being used perhaps where people are slightly embarrassed or like you said before have confidence issues about asking questions but you could have a facebook messenger actually have a chatbot that says OK, this is answering your question about dyslexia. So I'm guessing you have like a frequently asked questions uh, that come in, you know, again and again and again. And, and that could just respond in that way. And perhaps maybe it could be a chatbot that res- responds with audio. Um, but, yeah, it's just interesting when you were talking, I was thinking about that as a potential application as well. So here's, here's my invitation to, to you, Sophie, and to anybody who's listening if you feel that you would be willing to give some of your time to help the BDA to form a, a group, you know, um, which is about how we engage young people in, in this process, um, we would be really, really grateful and really willing to take on board, you know, ideas because um, – it is something that I mean, my background is not in technology. You know, my background is in, in teaching and education. And although people think of the British Dyslexia Association as a really large organisation, in fact, we have the equivalent of about 20 full time staff. We have the equivalent of, of of less than probably the average primary school in terms of staff resource. Um, what we rely on heavily is our volunteers. So around the country at the local Dyslexia Association, we probably have about 500 amazing volunteers who give their time to us um and so in the, the the setting up of these things really is you know what i would really like to do is empower and enable people who are willing to give their time to to work with us on this um and make it happen absolutely well i i, I think if, if something came out of the podcast and it was that this group was formed i'd be um ecstatic so <laughs> Well, there we are. Miracles happen all the time. So it's in, my, in my experience and in my, my life and my work, miracles happen all the time. And that's so. the right attitude as well. And just, just very quickly, just to end um, on that note, who's inspired you on your journey? So, you know, whether that's in this particular field or just generally that's helped frame how you approach, how you go about things. So I was really lucky because having having um, had to retake my A levels um, uh, because my grades initially were not good enough to get into any university, um, I did retakes and I then um, went to <coughs> excuse me the only university that would have me, which was Aston University um, in Birmingham, and I went to study human psychology, and I was extremely fortunate because my first year tutor was. The lady then, who was probably the country's leading expert in dyslexia, right. and there were not many of them. This is, you know, um, many, many years ago. Um, I'm 55 now, so imagine how many years Young ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, she was a lady called Dr. Margaret Newton. And in those days, unbelievably, um, now, we gave in our essays handwritten. So I gave in my, my first essay to her. Um, and she took one look at my handwriting and spelling and said, I think you better come and see me for an assessment. 
And so she diagnosed me in my first year at university. And then she said the most amazing thing to me. She said, first of all, she said, you're intelligent enough to be here, which about which I had had, you know, several doubts. Um, and that's a very common thing for dyslexics. They, they have this feeling someone's going to kind of tap them on the shoulder and say, by the way, you know, this is for clever people, not you sort of thing. Um and um, and I had uh, I had a lot of anxiety about whether or not I would pass the first year at university. So she said to me, you are clever enough to be here and you will be OK because I can teach you study skills and, and you know, you're going to be fine. That was really important for me. Um, but the other thing she said to me is she said, you know, dyslexia, you have a brain that, that makes connections in a different way. And that's why it's been difficult for you to learn these these skills you know in the early part of of education the reading writing spelling skills um but your brain can make connections that ours can't make and we need you to work in this field because this is a new and emerging field and we need someone who can think outside the box we need someone who can make those connections we can't make um and and therefore what she did was she turned what had always been for me just a difficulty a problem and she turned it not only into a strength but she turned it almost into a kind of a social responsibility to use this brain that can do things that other people's can't do a social responsibility to use that for good she was the most extraordinary woman most extraordinary it was such a privilege to have known her and sadly no longer with us um but um and then, of course, she taught me study skills. I mean, she worked me hard, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, I was there, you know, till till late at night burning the, the midnight oil. But she taught me how to, to summarise, how to write essays, essay structure, exam technique. She taught me to um, do past questions, present them to the different lecturers and say, if I would not get 100% for this, why not? And get them to articulate back why not because there were things that were inferred in the way the questions were phrased which i wasn't picking up until they made it explicit to me and this is one of the things with dyslexia is if you want a dyslexic to produce something that that, that is in your head then you need to make it visible to them so for example you want them to produce a really good bid report show them a really good bid report yeah because if they can see it they can produce it but they can't produce something which is is a vision that they don't have yet. If you can describe it to them really accurately and they can build that vision in their mind, then fine. But but much better thing is to physically show it to them and then they can then they can do it. That's fine. You know, if you know what you're doing, then you, you know if you see what it is, you literally see what they mean. Um, so yeah, she was amazing, and I worked with her as a psychologist doing uh, diagnostic assessments for many years thereafter. Even while I was working as a dyslexia specialist teacher and, and teacher trainer um, and senko, she was amazing. Uh, the magic of her was that when she did an assessment with a, with a child or with an adult, she always sent them out with improved self esteem, with an improved view of what who they were in the world and what they were going to bring to the world and it was simply that that's the way she saw them she saw potential in everybody in everybody and and she she did the psychological testing and of course with the psychological profile she could see then what that individual's strengths were and so she taught me that approach to assessment. And, and one of the nicest things a parent um, said to me about a child I'd assessed, for example, was um, she said to me, I don't know what you said to him, but he left your office two inches taller than he went in. <laughs> and that, to me, captures the essence of, of what it's about. You know, people say, well, what, what's the point in, in having an assessment? You know, what's the point? And, and to me, the point is that you are putting that child in front of someone who can see them maybe for the first time in their life can really see the potential in them and hopefully convey some of that back to them and 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 that's the the really great thing about it we do through bda we do offer um assessments now we didn't used to but we have found that there is such a a call for it that we do now offer assessments for adults and for for children and 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 one of the things around it is that it's just 
I think it's just so important for that individual to have an understanding of themselves and what their potential is, you know, um, and, and what their difficulties are. Well, Dr. Kate Saunders, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for describing Dr. Margaret Newton to us. She sounds pretty remarkable. She was. For those that are interested in your study and your project with Microsoft, you can find out at BET. But in the short term as well, if anyone's uh, able to assist with ideas to connect with young people and help spread the good message of the British Dyslexia Association, it's helpline at bdadyslexia.org.uk. .org.uk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Sophie. I'll let you know. Take care and have a great day. Thank you, Angie. That's all for this episode. If you want to catch up with the BDA Technology Committee, then please email helpline at bdadyslexia.org.uk. If you want to download the learning tools plugin, please go to www.onenote.com forward slash learning tools. And if you want to catch up with either myself, Mike or Dr. Kate Saunders at BET, email theedtechpodcast at gmail.com. Have a great week, everyone. And don't forget, you can download each episode individually to hear even more great detail from both of this week's guests or follow at podcast edtech.